I'm getting excited. So let me go back to the book. I'm going to let the book of Luke play out. If I tend to jump in there with a commentary, just forgive me. Yeah, I get excited when I'm reading, when, when I'm listening to the book of Luke. I'm going to let a couple chapters play out. Luke 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Luke 4. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. But that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt, Worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned, in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, When great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, Save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, Unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving name in the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up, and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. 
And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him, and hurt him not. And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. And he arose out of the synagogue, and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her, and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose, and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. And when it was day, he departed, and went into a desert place, and the people sought him, and came unto him, and stayed him, that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Luke 5 and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came, and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all, and followed him. And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who, seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand, and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man but go, and show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear, and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness, and prayed. And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee, and Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man, which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in, and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop, and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, 
Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. And after these things he went forth, and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans, and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often, and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast, while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles, and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved." No man also, having drunk old wine straightway, desireth new, for he saith, The old is better. Luke 6 And it came to pass on the second Sabbath, after the first, that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn, and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did, when himself was an hungered, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat but for the priests alone? And he said unto them, That the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts, and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up, and stand forth in the midst. And he arose, and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. And he came down with them, and stood in the plain, and the company of his disciples, and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him. 
and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him, and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil, for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? The sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! Cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit, for of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house, and digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Luke 7 now when he had entered all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. 
And a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying, that he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also... I am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, That a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea, throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, Among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And the Lord said, For unto then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace, and calling one to another and saying, we have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. But John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, 
a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus, answering, said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor, which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence, and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. For she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Luke 8. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. And when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it, and choked it, and other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. And the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Commentary time again. Did you guys contemplate chapter 7? Did you contemplate chapter 7? Chapter 7 is a beautiful chapter. Right before he gets into Luke chapter, Luke chapter eight is, is is my personal guidance chapter. It is. I use that for a lot of guidance. I read that often, meditate upon that often, because I don't want the word of God to be taken from me, twisted, 
you know, mold in any different way. But I need to speak to you about chapter 7. Beautiful chapter. Jesus kept saying to them, um, actually, he described John, right? He described John. And John, oh, I can see the chat room now. I can see it. Awesome. John, in John, <clears throat> John the Baptist, people were going out to him, right? And people were looking for somebody else. They, they were looking for somebody else. That's why it was written, what did you go out to see? What were you expecting to see? Right? See, they heard him. They heard of him. They heard of what he was speaking. But because they didn't want to accept what he was speaking, they said he had a devil. Then they went to go see who he was. And obviously they said, well, he has many devils. Yet he was a messenger that was sent to prepare the way before Christ. Jesus says, that uh, what went ye out, this is um, John, uh, Luke 7, 24, scripture fragment at the end. What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gloriously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Mm. And it says, and all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And the Lord said, where unto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? Let me stop right there. You see, they did not accept the word of God. When they went to go see who was speaking these things, they saw John, and then they just vigorously rejected it. They couldn't see him either, but they heard of what I was doing. No doubt they heard in intimacy exactly what he was preaching. But they wanted to go out and see exactly who was saying it. Right? Oh, I need to know who's saying this stuff. Why would a person say that? Because they can't recognize the truth of a spirit. That's why. So they wanted to see, and once they did see, they accused even more. They accused even more. They only wanted to see so they could destroy. It wasn't going to help them receive anything. That has never, ever been the case with anybody. They wanted to see a man, based upon their imaginations, qualified to say what he was saying like some great figure, and that's not what they saw. Spiritually, he was a greater figure than anybody else. Physically, he was not a great figure. Do you guys see how that works? To qualify the person, to qualify the vessel, that was the biggest mistake in the world. Because the words of a vessel are already qualified of the Lord. The vessel is qualified of the Lord. Therefore, it's never going to meet the world's standards. People go out to see things because they want to see something that mimics the ways they have in their hearts. Do you guys see that? If we hear an important uh, message on the television, but they didn't put a face to that important message... The first thing we're going to want to know is, who is this person that said that important thing? 
because we have to qualify the message, right? You don't know who it came from. You need to know if this person just hacked into the television network and spoke the thing, or is he from a, a, a is he a representative of an official capacity? That's what you'll want to find out to qualify the message. Well, see, with the Lord, the message is always qualified before the individuals, and the individuals are never qualified to give the message. Haven't you noticed that with the Lord? What the Holy Spirit gives you to put out, people will never qualify you to be worthy of putting out what you just did. You're always going to be challenged by those who cannot recognize anything spiritual. You'll always be challenged. You see how that works? There is no vessel worthy to speak those worthy things that come out of their mouth. The vessel can never be qualified of what the Lord gives. Never. Was John the Baptist physically qualified in the eyes of the, those who were against him to say what he said? No, they weren't. It says the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves. Because they weren't baptized of John, they rejected everything John said and the counsel of God within them. Because they did not approve of him saying what he said. That's why they wanted to see who he was. So they could condemn him more. That's all. This always happens with the Lord's word. Even when they see you to your face, they're still going to reject you twice as much. Hmm? Funny thing in it. That, that, that's just how it is. That's how it is. You can love a person. That person could be right near your presence. And they will still reject the counsel of God within themselves and question you about anything of God. They'll tell you every day that you're wrong. Well, then, why? I, you know, people a lot, I told you guys about these atheists, they'll say, well, why did God allow this child to die? If God is so loving, why did he allow this child to die? I get to talk to them because that's a very sincere question. And then you get to give them what's given to you by the Holy Spirit. They don't understand that it's mercy. They don't understand the nature of things. People who, children who die early are spared from the horrors to come in their life. But if a person be totally of the world, then all things exist to their purpose only, which means they can't see beyond their own purpose. Therefore, they misinterpret everything in the world. I've heard people say God is evil. God is not evil. Mankind destroys himself. And those same people you ask, well, can you? Some people say, well, even the p folks that I served in combat with, they'll say, well, why did so-and-so die? And we didn't. And then I'll say, well, will a person question what God is doing? And then we get down to a real conversation. I said, well, let's analyze his life. He was self-destructing. He was wayward. He couldn't conform, and his soul was surely about to be lost. Before the Lord loses an eternal soul, he will remove you from the face of the earth to save your soul. He's not going to allow you to continue to corrupt yourself if he really loves you. He's going to take you because he said he would never place upon you those things beyond that which you can bear. Also, you have to discuss the two origins of humans on this earth. There are some who are of God, some who are not. Right? How many would complain about the nation of Islam destroying themselves? You never heard that before. Why are the Islamic people killing each other? Have you ever heard that before in the wars between the Sunnis and Shiites? Have you ever heard that before? I haven't. I've heard no American ever complain about that. I've heard no person ever complain about that. Because everybody understands, well, that's just part of their faith. Right? Let me give you something else. There are other countries in the world, and because of their faith, they're dying like flies. Because they reject, they reject the living God, and they accept a false religion, and will kill anybody <clears throat> who utters the name Christ. And entire nations are suffering because of that. Their land is cursed and everything else, and guess what? 
they still refuse. And they die like that. You want an example? In parts of India, just like Africa and parts of Asia, it is against their religion. It is against their religion to plant food. Are you kidding? So they starve to death. It's against their religion to administer medications. So when they get sick and their immune system is shot because they don't plant food, they die. It's against their religion. It is in their religion every week to drink fresh urine from a cow. You see a lot of that in Africa, which is where strange diseases come from. And you dare not speak the name of Christ. Because something interesting happens in Africa in those parts of India and Asia. Wherever, wherever you see preaching of Christ in these countries taking place, the land begins to revive and the people begin to be healthy. Outside of those places, they hate Christ and they're dying. It's their own religion that's killing them. It's their own rejection of what is real and true that's killing them. And then they kill each other. Isn't that something? But then the common person in the world, they'll look at these situations and say, why is God not doing anything? That's what they'll say, because they don't know the backstory. And you have to know the backstory. Right? Well, it's the same thing the Pharisees, they did here. They didn't know the backstory of John the Baptist. And so what did they do? They took a 100% accusatory stance against John the Baptist. When there was no other prophet greater than he was, because he was, he, he was the spirit of Elijah. Jesus said that himself, spirit of Elijah. Hmm. In other words, the world recognizes not what a person says, but who the person is. And they seek to accuse the person by what he says in the kingdom of God. Because in the kingdom of God, things are spoken by way of the Father. They will not accept what is said, and they seek to kill the vessel. So they only want to know a person that they may accuse him more and more. In the kingdom of God, they won't believe what is spoken like that right but those of the spirit you hear the voice of truth no matter who it comes through if it comes through a mule you're going to hear it if it comes through a rock you're going to hear it if it comes through a wino in the street you're going to hear it you're going to hear the truth anywhere it's spoken and it is written jesus said my sheep hear my voice well, his voice is the word of God. So that means if you belong to God, you're going to hear God's word and truth. Period. If, you're, if you are, if Christ is your shepherd, that means the word is your shepherd. And if the word is your shepherd, you're going to hear the words of that shepherd no matter who they come through. It'll be an instant recognition. The world does not work that way. The world will never hear what you say lest they qualify who you are. In the kingdom of God, you will hear the words of truth, no matter who it comes through. This is an example all the time in the word of God. All the time. It happens all the time in the word of God. The most unlikely individuals will come up and say the truth to individuals. People nobody ever knew about. They were looking at the important people of society for the important things, but wouldn't you know what? The real important things came through those they ignore in society. It came through those who had the worst reputation in society. The disciples themselves had very bad reputations. Look at Peter himself. He couldn't help but to curse. This guy would curse everything. Look at Matthew. Look, look at all the disciples. They had hang-ups and problems. No one would ever expect the word of God to flow through men like that. And that's exactly who Jesus picked, didn't he? Did he not pick the worst of the worst? Didn't he? Why? They were so burnt out in life that they were primed and ready. God had touched them already in the beginning to hear his words. 
Beautiful. I find it beautiful. Now, man will never pick a disciple based upon that. His appearance would have to be right. His lineage would have to be right. How he appears to everybody else would have to be right. They'd have to do background checks and everything else. All right? Before they picked a person to hold any seat like that. The reason why they didn't want to hear what Jesus said is because he didn't follow those traditions in picking. God had already ordained them from the beginning. The worst of the worst. He knew exactly what they were going to do. But they were the one touched by the living God. And the Pharisees and the lawyers said, how can this be? They questioned that also. Can you see that the kingdom does not work like the world? It doesn't work like the world. Hmm? You know, something. It doesn't work like that. God is awesome. Is also true. He can also he also sees what we don't see. And Jesus came to do some very good things for us. Everything he did to people physically, he also did to us in the spirit. Hmm? That's right, Anthony. Even while the disciples walked with Jesus, they were incomplete. That's right. Just like we are when he said, come follow me. They were learning just like we are. They walked beside him, and they still couldn't have faith in him. I would be ashamed of myself. But then we hear his word and still don't do it. But we believe, and we haven't seen in fact, Jesus said one time in the waters when he went to the opposite side of the water, he said, well, you guys are following me because I fed you. Your stomachs are full. That's why you're following me. You're following me for what I can provide to you. He said, don't do that. Don't follow me for what I can provide to you. Do you guys remember Jesus saying that? That's what he told them. He said, you, are, you were seeking me because I fed you. That's what he said. You were seeking me because I fed you. He said, don't follow me for what you can get out of me. And do you know what? How many people follow Christ for what they can get out of him? Because they want to be fed again. You know what that means? A person who follows Christ because they're fed of him. When they're full of anything, they'll no longer follow Christ. If we follow anything for what we can get out of it, we can easily follow something else. That's how people are going to fall away. Because many people in this day and age follow Christ for what they can get out of him. The origin of their following, the, the motive of following Christ is not simple recognition of him being Lord. That should be the motive. That is the rock of the church, right? But people follow Christ and, and get in, in, in these churches and everything else for what they can get out of it. And that's why the ministers will say, hey, if you, if you tie a $50, God's going to give you 5000 And so lots of people tie a $50 expecting to get 5000 They get happy, well, I'm getting something out of this. And so, of course, they're going to give in to that place. Right? But the Lord says, don't do that. When Peter said, you are the Christ, that truth was revealed to him from the Father. Jesus said, upon this rock, I build my church. So those who are motivated because Jesus is the Messiah to them, not for any other reason, they truly belong to his church. Those who are following Christ for what they can get out of him will eventually walk away and stray many times throughout their lives. It's not a real motivation. That's not a motivation of truth. Because if I follow anybody for what I can get out of them, right? Like if they feed me physically, then I'm looking to save my own body to provide for myself through following somebody else. I just found a way not to work is what I did. Telling you the truth, I found a way not to work. And so I'm going to follow somebody and agree with everything they say just to get something out of them so I can be taken care of. That's not a real motivation. That is selfish at its core. That is a way of men, not the children of the living God. But to follow Christ for recognition that he is the Messiah. Now, that's a real reason. Because you recognize he is the Messiah, and you're not looking to get anything out of him. That's a real reason. Do you not know what were the disciples looking to get out of him? Because right after that time when he said, you're following me, 
because you've been fed the fish and the loaves. Then when he said he was the bread of heaven, half of them walked away. They could not stomach that saying. They didn't even know what it meant. They said, oh, I can't believe this has gone fruitcake on me. Jesus said he was the bread of heaven. To eat of him, they couldn't understand that. So they walked away. It, it was recorded in the Bible that many of them, slews of people walked away, no longer following him after that. All those people that were fed of him, the fish. When he told them that he was the bread of heaven, they couldn't take the saying and they walked away. Why? Because they were following him to eat more, to sustain themselves. They were following him to sustain themselves. In other words, their whole purpose of following Christ was to be sustained. That was their whole premise. And when they learned the truth of who he was, they walked away. Because basically he told them, I'm not going to feed your flesh. That's, that's basically what he said. I'm not here to feed your flesh. And they walked away. They said, well, he, he can't survive off him. Let's go to work, gentlemen. We followed him for a week. That's the end of that. He started talking about some other stuff. And we're trying to stay alive. Right? And they walked away. And that's a big lesson for us, that if we're following Christ, to feed ourselves and to sustain ourselves physically, we're going to walk away. Oh, boy, that's a spooky thought, isn't it? Because many people, many people pray simply to be sustained. Many people follow Christ simply to be sustained and they're scared to death of failing and not being sustained and that's why they follow christ that's why they follow christ but who follows christ simply because you recognized he is the son of the living god who follows christ simply because you recognized he is the messiah hmm? ashley says can a woman lead the house if a man does not, well, leave the house how? As, as far as being in charge of the household? If a man does not? I give you this. If you don't agree with how a man is running the house, right? If you don't agree with the life operations of that male, Oh, the, I guess the question is, how do we end up with folks like that? What in the world type of process do we pick somebody to spend the rest of our lives with? I guess that would be the question, right? Because if you marry somebody, if, if somebody is with somebody who's a non-believer, they're not going to run the house according to your standards. They're just not going to do it. You being a woman, though, if you're a woman, listen to me carefully, women. You guys ready for this, women? You don't even understand the power that you have, do you? You don't have to run the house. You don't have to. You have the influence of the entire house. Why would you want to run a house when you have the influence of a house? Do you not know a male exists? Because he is, in fact, captivated by you, the backbone of him. You don't understand most women don't understand what the glory of the Lord is upon their lives anyway. They don't. Right? You were made the way you were made to subdue mankind, to subdue the animalistic nature in mankind. Do you know that? You were made the way you are to subdue the animalistic nature in mankind, which is just raw strength. But you were made the individual that contained the beast. You really were. Now, if you're outspoken, you're going to provoke the beast, and the animal comes all the way out. If you want to have it your way or the highway, you're going to provoke the animal. Then you're going to, you can't confront. If, if, if one predator confronts another predator, you have a fight. You're meant to subdue that animal in that male so that he can truly stand. You really do make the difference. God made the man the head of all things, but it is the woman who can subdue the animal in that man. And when the animal is subdued in the man, then the man stands up in righteousness. And when that happens, nothing's coming into your home. So the idea is not to run the home, 
but to function in accordance with the grace God has bestowed upon you naturally. To not allow that animalistic behavior to go on in there. You've been given every, every, every thing to subdue that animalistic behavior in us males. You have. The animal always rises when provoked. Well, through a great time of necessity, and any time a woman mandates to an animal and backs him into a corner, that woman's going to get bit. And you weren't called to do that. You were never called to provoke the animal in someone. You were called to subdue it. Always subdue it. You're the, you're the key to your own life. That's so funny. A woman is the key to her own life. Now, here's a challenge to a woman. You will either be what God designed you to be and know exactly who you are, or you're going to continue to operate as you think you need to operate and never achieve anything. Right? Just like the word says, there is a way that seems right unto man, but it's not right at all. Right? It's not right at all. And believe me, I've seen some virtuous women, wives, of some horrible men. And within a couple of years, because that woman seems to be so very astute in taming that animal, the man changes, becomes a believer. And it turns into a beautiful thing. The man being an unbeliever in the beginning. But the woman never provoked the male. Never provoked the male. Right? Here it is. Can I, can I share? I'm going to share this one thing. If a person says, well, I didn't provoke them, that just simply means you can't see that you're provoking them. But if somebody else looks in and says, yeah, you provoked them, and you say, well, I don't believe I did, well, what you're doing is denying your own activities. Because if everybody else can see you provoking someone, then you're provoking them. If you're the only one that can see that you're not provoking them, then you're blind, Right? That happens a lot. And sometimes we can get so hard-headed that everybody can see a person is provoking the other person, but the person themselves can't see it. And we must never find ourselves in this position because that's a position of pride to say, I'm right and they're wrong. I'm the believer, they're the unbeliever, therefore I'm right and they're wrong. That's not true. That's not true at all. Right? The greatest power exercised on this earth was what? What was the greatest power ever exercised on the face of the earth? Do you guys know what it is? What that power is? The greatest power exercised on the face of the earth was when Jesus didn't do a thing and he surrendered all things that they may kill him to be that sacrifice. Jesus within himself had the authority and strength to undo every human life on the face of this earth. The earth was created through the word of God, which is Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, yes, he had the power. He raised himself up by his own power. How many of you know that? Do you know that Jesus raised himself up? Because he said it himself, I have the power to lay down this life and to take it up again. Jesus said he had the power to do that. So he allowed them to do that, and he, he, he gave himself life again. Many people don't even know that. And the greatest act on the face of this earth was when the greatest power on the face of this earth did nothing for the sake of everybody else. That's the greatest power exercised, that Jesus would do nothing for the sake of all life on this earth. That's awesome. And it's so true because guess what? It's very easy to be angry and to respond. It's of a greater challenge to not say a word and maintain a standard in love with meekness and humility. That takes a lot of strength. The true strength comes by not taking revenge. It's easy to take revenge because to take revenge is to simply let the flesh exercise what it wants. To subdue the flesh. Well, now, that's a fight on your hands, right? You can't stand spiritually if your flesh is standing too. To stand spiritually, your flesh must be under all subjection. 
or else you're standing in the flesh. Hope that helps. But provoking has no place in the house of God, nor does it have place in the beautiful lives the Lord has graced you all with. That's not the way. You're people of compassion, of great love. So live in that capacity by trusting in the Lord. He designed you male or female, operating your capacities. Just how he departed it to you. Don't experiment with life. Life has already been determined by the Father. Follow his ways and you'll see the outcome of his hand. To wait upon the Lord is to do those things of the Lord. And when there's no instruction, you just sit back. You'll see the salvation of the Lord every single time. Hmm? All time. You see it every time. Anyway, that's my interjection. In Luke chapter 7. And part of 8, it was going into about how people lose the word. Now that is my, that truly is my, that, that chapter, chapter 8, is something I go through often. Right? Because in all these ways in which the word of God is taken from people, Luke chapter 8 starting 5, going all the way through to 18, is truly how the word, the seed of God, is taken from people. One of the big ones is the cares of this world, cares of this life. And believe me, your cares of this life can flood out the seed of God. It really can. And you're going to hear Jesus speak about this. You're going to hear him speak about this. And it is very, 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 it, it, it is a something I go through on a, on a, I mean, I go through this almost on a daily basis to make sure, I have to make sure that I heed the instruction and advisement of my Lord because he told me through chapter 8 exactly what would take the word of God out of me. You see, I don't want to lose his precious word in my life. The word of God is the power that sustains me. It's not food, nor is it substance or sustenance. It is, in fact, the word of God that sustains me. I can have everything I need in my life and still be empty because I won't have the word of God. I could be a billionaire and my soul could be so empty and full of darkness that I'd want to commit suicide and nobody would know it. Consequently, there are a lot of billionaires that feel that way, a lot of millionaires that feel that way. And you've got to ask yourself, how in the world can a millionaire or a billionaire want to commit suicide because their soul is empty? Their soul is empty. Hmm. Actually, that would be something better suited in a dual conversation with Angela and myself, and of course you, right? But Angela and myself and you, so that we can know the whole situation and get biblical guidance in that. Not personal guidance, biblical guidance, right? Because biblical guidance or those words Christ spoke pertaining to your situation, they will always have the outcome of truth. And so that would take a dual conversation with Angela and myself and you at the same time. That's the correct way to do it. I can't off the hip give you some advice, right? But Angela and I together with yourself after talking and, and, and a prayer or two, the Lord will reveal the true answers are most often given among a council. Not among the one, but among a council. And that's how that would work. But I do know this. If you're the believer and the other person is not, you're the covering for the entire house. You're the covering for the entire place. You are. And ultimately, your decision on how to stand and what you deem will make the difference in that entire house. But do this. Never put limitations on the heart of the one God can absolutely change. I can almost tell you right now, 
He's showing us something. Here's something I want you guys to remember. <clears throat> I know a lot of women. Now, anybody who's been abused, and it's still fresh in your mind how you've been abused, you're really not qualified to, to really comprehend what I'm saying. It's because the emotions will get the best of you. But listen to me close. There are often times in our situations, looking back, because while I was, listen, <clears throat> a long time ago I used to work with a lot of suicide victims, right? I used to talk to rape victims in the Army. Suicide victims and rape victims in the Army. They were in the Army. And I used to hear the same things all the time. All that same repetitive story all the time. Now, having that, having that responsibility, you, you cannot interject religion. Right? You, you couldn't do it at that time. It, it had to be professional advice, but let me share something with you. These people who did that, they, they, it was just not anybody coming up to do what they did to these women. It was often the people they knew. Right? It was often the person that was at the party. Correct? In just about every single case, they knew the individual that did that. They just didn't know that the individual would go that far, right? This is for the rape victims. And what I noticed was this. There are a lot of folks out there in the world, and their mental capacity and the place that they're in is either one of two things. They absolutely didn't know, in which case they were innocent of doing anything, and I've always found that the Lord restores those people. Or they were persons who were at the party, drinking and living it up, and they got caught off guard. They let their defenses down, got caught off guard. It happened at a time when they're vulnerable, right? In the other cases, the person knew nothing about it, in which case I've seen God prepare their lives very quickly. And now they can see the traits because they always see their victim first. That's the funniest thing. They see their victim first. And we're talking about the good nature. Now, there's some bad people out there, right, that don't. Uh, there's some bad people out there that just do things. But what I've noticed is this. When this happens to an individual, correct, the Lord will sometimes, now remember, he's going to save our souls. He'll save our souls. And often when this happens to an individual, it, it allows this individual to do two things in their lives. Number one, because they were abused like this, they have stopped a generational curse from ever touching their children because now they're able to recognize that abuser's spirit in anybody. And they will forbid that from touching their children. They'll forbid it. They won't allow that to touch your children. So it can't work. Remember, whenever an evil is seen, it can no longer work. It can't work if it's found. Right? The Lord also breaks us from our own mindset. Because we don't know enough to navigate life. We, we really don't. We need the Lord to do that. Right? And so now you have two things. You now can see that that evil spirit that is anywhere in the world, anybody who's been abused, you can go into a grocery store and you begin to spot character traits. You, you see something beyond the flesh and you'll, you'll back up on a person. You say, oops, I know that one. That one is there. You'll see it with absolute clarity and nobody else will be able to spot it. But most importantly, you have stopped that thing from ever going to your children. Isn't that something? Because now you can see it. But you can also see it in a lot of other people's lives. And the reason why you were made to see it and you experienced that thing and you still live today, now you've got to ask yourself, why would God do that? Why would he send you through that horror and you live today? I'll tell you why. Because evil never stops. Now you can go to a person who has been abused and see they can't talk to just anybody who's not been abused. But now... Once you have fully recovered, all revenge is out of your heart and everything else. <clears throat> Guess what? You can now qualify and talk to an individual who's going through the same thing, sparing them from what you went through. The whole thing is this. The things we go through in our lives, 
certainly do spare others from going through that same thing. You're a blessing to your generation. Do you know that? You're a blessing to your generation. One way or the other, all of you will break free. Nothing will consume you. And you've been broken in certain ways that you may spare somebody else from being broken. It is because of you. It's going to be because of you that your testimony saves the lives of many because you believe upon the Lord your God. You believe upon him. The one thing we should never do is limit the strength of our Lord and the wisdom of our God to our wisdom or strength. Our strength fails. God's strength never does. He purposes all things. All things are purposed. And remember, you're not here by the will of man nor of blood, but you're here by the will of God. He already knew about your life prior to being here. So the real question is, what, Lord, are you teaching me? Because it will be made known what he is teaching you. Hmm? So I give you that. You can now recognize those serpents that seek to do sexual harm and physical harm to females out there. You can spot them a mile away. And once you're over the revenge part, once you're over that, the power within you can never be undone. Your eyes have been opened. Your eyes have been opened. Once your eyes are open, it's important. Because, listen, a devil can always work when you can't see them. The moment you see them, they can't work. Do you know that? A devil can always work when you cannot see them. Once you can see them, they cannot work. I could share with some of you how my eyes were opened. And I can assure you it's, it's a little worse than the average person thinks. But they were opened. And it didn't hurt me a bit. Though it almost destroyed my flesh, it didn't hurt me a bit. You'd rather go through two lifetimes than to go through that. You really would. To sit at death's door for so long is not fun. And to live through it is worse. But it opens your eyes. And you can see the signs and things in this world that lead up. You can see a person's life saying, Oop, I know they're going right into that captivity. Lord, can I intercede for this individual? Sometimes he'll say yes. Sometimes he'll say no. But the final outcome is this. You belong to the Lord. And because you belong to the Lord... You will be delivered, everyone. Everyone found in the book of life will be delivered. You know what the Lord says that? Everyone found in the book of life will be delivered. Every single one. If you can get beyond the revenge, you can see the truth, each and every one of you. Now, let me ask you this. How could you ever rule and reign with Christ if you had no idea the depth of the evil that resided in the world? How could you rule and reign with Christ like that? You couldn't, because you would have no knowledge of anything, would you? You wouldn't know anything. And we fall prey to a lot of things in this world. Why? Because we are beguiled into doing so. People trick us. People trick little children through their rottenness, and then that child can be abused. People trick a lot, don't they? To abuse another, to destroy another, they trick tricksters trick them and then they scar them for life so they thought that's the devil's operation that never works right it does not work to them who are called of the lord because he will deliver each and every one of them each and every one you will be delivered it's very important to ask of the father lord what are you showing me what are you showing me? That's very important because all too often the truth is never understood until the end of a matter. Never in the middle of a matter. 
It, it's almost next to never a person gains the truth right in the middle of a matter. But the word says this. When you stand in the word of God, when you have those traits of meekness and humility and you stand on the word of God, not varying from left to right, the Lord is your savior. Every moment you stand on the word of God, the Lord is your salvation. Every moment you don't stand on the word of God, it is mercy that keeps you alive. If you stand on the word of God, based on the truth of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit, guess what? The Lord is truly your salvation. Gentlemen, that goes for you too. It goes for whatever circumstance you're in. It doesn't matter what circumstance you're in. We have people in COT that have PTSD of the worst kind from very real situations. I've told you before, I am really, it's a marvel I don't have PTSD. It's unheard of. I, don't, I should have PTSD. I should really be dead from chemical exposure, overexposure to radiation and things of that nature. I should really be dead from trauma. I should be dead, but I'm not. I'd rather have a thousand car accidents. I'd rather be physically wounded a, a thousand times over than to go through what I went through. I should have trauma, but I do not. Anybody care to, you want to know my secret? Hmm? Anybody? There's a secret to it. I don't have PTSD because there is a secret. You want to know the secret? It's very simple. See, I'm right here today, right now, right? All that stuff that took place was yesterday, right? It was yesterday. It's not today. It was yesterday. But all those things I went through, I had to go through. Or I would have no understanding, wisdom, or knowledge today. All those things I went through, I've been qualified to speak the things I speak today. Every single last bit of them is qualified. I'm no longer offended because my flesh was hurt and nearly put to death because Jesus came to save my soul. Right? Jesus saved my soul. I have no more fear left because I've seen tribulation. Tribulation does not scare me. Neither does a threat of death. Neither a threat of death for my physical body nor my situation. It still can't make me fear. Even if my entire situation died, it still can't make me fear. That comes through qualification. And because of those qualifications, where you lack faith, I can have faith. You're qualified in certain things I'm not qualified in. And where I lack faith, you can have faith. I went through everything I went through that I may depart to someone, to someone, something that will assist them in the walk with Christ. It doesn't matter how much or how little. It matters that you went through something to qualify you for what you will speak to another. Because anything we speak to another, if it be from a hypocritical standpoint, if we're just echoing something somebody said, having not gone through it ourselves, we're not qualified to say it. And it does not carry the power of the living God with it. God does not work in hypocrisy. So then, to teach a person of something you yourselves have never been taught is hypocrisy. To tell a person, hey, you stay with the Lord, he will deliver you. And then we doubt he's going to deliver us is to speak with hypocrisies. Whom he called, he also qualified. And those, quali those qualifications will be known. But I encourage everybody, let nothing steal the seed of the word of God from you. The biggest secret I have is this. I can see it. But I don't know a lot in the word of God. In fact, the more I learn, the more I realize I never knew in the first place. And I leave that to the Father. That's no longer a burden. I realize this, that mankind lives their lives based on imaginations. And what I see the ending of something being in the flesh is often not what the ending is. No need for me to be upset. When you walk by truth, you're shown a thing, not beforehand. 
but in the right timing when you're walking in that thing. And all of those written in the book of life will know the truth. And that truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. What truth is that? Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And he will make you free. He is your answer. He is your advice given to you by the Holy Spirit. It can be encouraged by those who've gone through the same situation. Because he's the only one that can help you understand everything. Never make a decision understanding half of something. Don't do that to yourselves. Please don't do that. I've done that too many. Don't you do it. Don't do it to yourselves. That's when you have to rely upon the truth of the Father. If you know half of a thing and you're wrong about the other half, you have just messed up. Please believe me on that. Don't do it to yourselves. Because knowing half is really not knowing anything at all. And if you start making moves based on a small portion of something that we know, but we don't know the other portions, you're going to make a mistake and perpetuate your own pain. Don't do that to yourselves. The Lord will allow you to see the whole thing of what we need to change. Oh, and then lastly, there are a lot of times when we think another person has to change. But here's the truth. We have to change. There are things written in the Bible that if we do them, the outcome of the Lord is certain. But if we don't do those things the Lord said to do, we won't see the outcome of the Lord. If you want the outcome of the Lord in your life according to Scripture, then comply with those things he said to do. There are times when he said do nothing. There are times when he said walk out the door. There are times when he said you stand firm and you declare love. There are times and seasons for all things. To understand the time, you must have the Holy Spirit. To understand the season, you must be able to see. In order for you to see, you must truly repent of all things in your own life. We must never act like we're squeaky clean. We must concede and admit that we are in fact sinners saved by grace. The one who acknowledges that they don't have sin will never be free of that bondage. But the one who says, I was a terrible, I was the best sinner on the face of the earth, that person just admitted that they were the best sinner on the face of the earth, therefore they can truly repent. That is fruit worthy of repentance. You guys remember that statement, reading that earlier in John? To bring to the Lord fruit worthy of repentance. Or that was the beginning of the book of Luke. Hmm? You remember that? Hmm? All those written in the book of life will be delivered, every single one. But you're being empowered. Whom he called, he also qualified. All you have to do is say, well, how does a person get qualified? I'll tell you how they get qualified. By being in bondage and God breaking that bondage. By being dead and God raises you from the dead. By being blind and God gives you sight. By being uh, wounded and God heals that wound. By not being able to walk and God says, take up your bed and walk. When you're healed of a blindness, you have a testimony of his power in your life. You can testify to that power of Christ. That yes, he can give you sight. When you're trapped in prison. And the Lord releases you. You can say, hey, he won't only release me. He didn't only release me, but everybody that was with me in prison, he released. You'll have that testimony. Guess what happens when you have a testimony? You only have a testimony because now you're qualified to tell that testimony. So ask yourself this question. What testimony has the Father granted to you? You will be victorious. When you're found in the book of life, you will be delivered. Don't worry about if you're going to be delivered or not. Those are thoughts of old. You will be delivered, every single one found in the book of life. Listen, I'll say it again. You will be delivered by the hand of the Messiah, everyone written in the book of life. You will be delivered. Can everybody understand that? You will be light. And you will confound the darkness. And light 
penetrates all darkness, changing darkness into light itself. That's why darkness flees from light. Light overtakes darkness all the time. Doesn't the sun shine on the earth? Yes, but if the sun winked out, there would be no light upon the earth. The moon would not have light. The sun is a great light in our solar system. But if it ever went out, we'd be plunged into darkness. We can have storms, we can have night, but the light still shines. The light warms the earth. Without the sun, we would freeze to death. The light warms the earth. The light provides life. That light can be changed into food, life-sustaining food. That's why I like this day. And remember, I don't like the other stuff of this day, but I love it for the fact. It is the day at least the world remembers the birth of the greatest gift humanity has ever received. The greatest gift humanity has ever received. Today. I guess the question is, in the hearts of people, is it truly a gift to them? Because it's a gift to me. It's a gift to me because I know the depths of where I was. See, when you understand where you were, you can't help but to be thankful every hour of your life. There'll be no sorrow that overtakes me. There won't be. I, listen, I, I wish I could tell you guys something, but if I can't do it yet, it's premature. This one I'll have to tell you face to face. I will. I'll have to put a face to this testimony. But I'm going to tell you something. Because you'll do your diligence and homework and say, oh, my Lord, it's true. And that's what I want you to do. Because it's a testimony. See, that will be the only time I'll give you guys some facts of facts so that you understand my personal testimony. That's when you're going to have facts. Because it is my testimony. And to receive my testimony, you're going to have to know what happened to me. You're going to have to review what happened to me so you can see it for yourselves. And believe me, it's a great contrast from what you already know, which is me. But the testimony itself is a testimony for so many different situations. And I really do wish I could speak about it right now, but I can't. So let's get that off the table. But I can tell you this. It does not matter how hopeless something looks. The Lord delivers always. Doesn't matter how hopeless it looks. God will always teach, always. It doesn't matter how dark it appears. The light will shine upon you again. You know what? No one can ever take that away from me. No one can ever tell me God will not show up. No one on the face of this earth, nor in heaven, nor in hell, can ever tell me God will not deliver his children. Not one soul can ever convince me of that. And because I know that for a fact, because I lived that, I'll never back down on my faith to tell you that Jesus is truly Lord. I'm qualified now to say Jesus is Lord. Lord over all things in our lives. Oh, yes, he is Lord. And if he's Lord, that that means he's over everything in your life. And if he's over everything in your life, I submit to you today concerning me, I have no complaints about today. I never do. I don't like some of the elements in today, but I know it's purposed. I don't have to understand the purpose anymore because I know he delivers Oh, he delivers. Hmm. Let's get back to the book of uh, Luke. I'm going to let it play out to the last chapter, folks. Okay. Well, well, maybe not. Maybe not the last chapter. We keep letting it go forward. Okay. We'll keep letting it go forward. In a lot of people's situations, so back to Ashley, it takes two people to understand both sides. But the Lord... 
We'll give you guidance after that. Hmm. Anthony says that qualification comes at a cost. But in truth, that burden is high. It's right. Anthony, you're exactly right. The qualification comes at great cost. Great cost. You, you, Anthony, ironically, I'll tell you something that's funny. How we are qualified was in the world of sin, which is so funny, right? We were thrust into situations, whether we did it or not, to be in a certain position. It doesn't matter how. It could be from your servitude or something else, but we're thrust in these positions because that's the only way we can truly ever be qualified to say, yes, the Lord delivers. How could I say the Lord delivers if I were never delivered? How could I say that? I can also tell you that the victory is ours and that that victory is for today. I'm qualified to say that too. I can say that because I can see. Do you not know that a blind person may never see a victory today because they're blind? But a person whose eyes are open will be perpetually thankful to the Father. Let me give you an example. Let's just say beside me is a blind person. Right? And we're both driving in a car down the road. Right? I see a truck go into my lane and it looks like it hit a piece of glass that pushes it back. It just defies explanation. I'm throwing a conniption fit over here, saying, the Lord just saved us. The blind person has no idea. To him, it has no meaning. To me, because I saw the truck come off of the road and get pushed back into his lane, that was miraculous. So I'm giving thanks, and the blind man is saying, well, I'm thirsty. He has no idea what just happened because he couldn't see it. I'm the one that saw it, so I'm the one giving thanks. His eyes are shut, so he can't see it. Right? Let me give you another example with the same person. Let's say I'm driving down the highway, and I'm dozing off, and something hits me and startles me and says, turn left now, not turn left, screech the wheels and everything. And then I look back, and it's a cliff over that side. Had I not been startled and woke up by the spirit i would have been dead and so would he he hears the screeching of the wheels and he's fussing at me and i'm giving thanks because god saved our lives my heart is thankful again he's complaining that my driving skills are not too good well why did you turn like that you could have made me spill my coffee or something like that right but i'm giving thanks the lord just saved our lives again he can't see a thing but because i'm the one rejoicing it lets you know I'm the one that saw the deliverance. Do you know that happens all the time? The one who complains can't see the delivering hand of the Lord. The one who gives thanks is seeing how God is delivering them from so many things. Why? Because their eyes are open. That's the difference of having your eyes opened and your eyes shut. When your eyes are opened, you will give thanks. When your eyes are shut... When you're blind and cannot see, you're not going to give thanks. All you're going to see is problems. But with your eyes open, all you're going to do is give thanks. Because you begin to realize you could have been dead. Your situation could be worse. I could have lost everything. But the Lord sustained me and I didn't even deserve it. I was dozing off to sleep because I physically couldn't stay awake. And the Lord woke me up and then gave me instruction and he saved my life. You begin to give thanks. You'll see all those impossible situations and everything else. And you'll see the delivering hand of the Lord because your eyes are open. But I submit to you this. A blind man will never give thanks. A blind man will make up things to give thanks. And the Lord came to restore sight to the blind. Did he not? He is the one that he, Jesus came to open our eyes. And when he does so, you will rejoice. That's a very simple explanation as to how it works in the real world. Because if we could see the delivering hand of the Father, we would give thanks rather than complain. But if we are blinded, that means we cannot see the Father in action. And we don't even think about him. I desire that my eyes be open always. I don't resist him anymore in the opening of my eyes. And it came at a great cost to have my eyes opened. Because that's how it had to be for me. But I went through that so that you could just open your eyes. The Lord, why did the Lord bestow his powers upon you in the first place? Why did he tell you that? 
Why did he say, go out to the world, make disciples and heal and, and raise the dead and do Why did he say that? I'll tell you why. Because you were the one qualified to carry that power. Every generation, every generation, because you're qualified to do it, you can break those chains off of them, giving them a better way to understand it. That they don't have to go through it. See, we're purposed and qualified to pick people up after they've fallen through the same traps we went through. Because remember, he's making a quick work of many things. So why should a person have to go through everything you went through? We didn't go through everything our parents went through. Our parents didn't go everything their parents went through. We're not crucified because we believe in Christ, are we? We're not stoned to death because we sin. We're not crucified like the disciples, are we? No, we're not. We're not burned. We're not. Why? Because we have the testimony of the disciples. We have sayings of other folks who have testimonies. And through their testimony, we were spared many things in our lives, and the entire society has changed. Can we not see that? That you went through something so somebody else wouldn't have to endure all the pain you went through. The selfish hearts will say this, well, they should go through every single piece of pain I went through. That's a selfish and evil heart. The meek and humble heart says this, ah, thank you, Lord, that you broke me so they don't have to be broken that way because nobody deserves to go through that. Now you have something to pray for. Now when I look at some of you folks, I'll say, Lord, please intercede. Don't let them go through this. Just allow them to hear me in my testimony and, and, and allow them to hear it, Lord. Don't send them through that because I have compassion upon some people before they even enter into something. My eyes are always fixed on God's precious children. No need for anybody to go through what I went through. If I can assist them. If my testimony can convey a truth to that individual, they need not go through it. That's what the testimony is for. That my life, that my life represent his deliverance. That my life represent his faith. I don't care what I have to go through. I, I really don't. I've gone through many things, go through many things, am going through many things. It does not matter what really matters is that I can be a vessel of usage to the Father to assist you. This entire point is about you. Because again, the Savior was born, and how can we pay him back? How? Can we even pay the Lord back for the cross? No. We can't pay him back. But then he gave me something. He said, what you do to the least of these, you've also done unto me. I said, thank you, Lord. That's what I need to know. So guess what? Through unconditional, my unconditional love towards you. And if I have to suffer for your sakes, and so be it. Because whatever I do to you, I do unto Christ. Whatever I do to my enemy, I do unto Christ. Whatever I do unto those who are against me, I do unto Christ. That's the only way, the only thing I can grant unto my Lord is to do things unto you that Christ receives it. Because that's the truth. That's it. Isn't that a simple truth? It's a very simple truth. But it still has it, it, it doesn't hold a hill of beans towards what God did and what Christ did. But I do know this. Everyone found in the book of life will be delivered, every single one. Every single one. And this day marks that gift given to all men. This day in remembrance of so many people marks that. That is called a victory, an eternal gift. We didn't even ask for that gift. It was granted to us before we had full knowledge of it. Marvelous, isn't it? Isn't it marvelous? You get a gift you didn't ask for, but you absolutely beg for. Isn't that something? 
the greatest gift humanity could ever receive. I don't know about you, but I... Dr. Dr. V, you coming on? Somebody, somebody get Dr. Is Dr. V coming on? You guys are letting me talk too much, and I'm running my mouth. Dr. V, are you coming on? Is your broadcast coming on? Yes? Is that a yes? Is he going to fire it up? Anybody out there? Somebody get a hold of Dr. V? Type in there. Is Dr. V going to start his show up? He might. Hey, for everybody that's been here for this, how long have we been on here? Not too long. Anyway, I want to say Merry Christmas to everybody. And this is the 25th, isn't it? The threshold day. Today is a threshold. Threshold. Dr. V, I wanted to know, were you coming on? Were you coming on? Because you can. I'm going to prep some things, and I just really want to stop by and say, folks, our Lord truly does love us. He's the one taking care of us. I just hope I departed some spiritual truth to you today, something that helps I sincerely hope in the continued walk that you have that the Lord will bring you way beyond where I could ever go. You'll go far beyond any place, any platform I could ever have. You'll be much higher. Much, much, much higher. I am the least, if, if we are all servants, and I guarantee you I'm the least of all the servants because I'm the one speaking. Who's greater, the teacher or the students? I tell you, the students are greater than the teacher because the teacher is employed for the sake of the students. So what does that tell you? The students are important, not the teacher. The teacher works so that the students may be far beyond him. So some of you call me a Bible study teacher. I don't call myself that. Nor do I call myself a pastor or anything else. But I'll say this, it's always an honor to be able to assist any child of the living God. Even the ones that don't know they're children of the living God yet. It's an honor. And my entire life is worth it. If all my life boiled down to this one day, to be able to depart to you something that you can use... And guess what? Everything was worth it. And I'm telling the truth. My entire life and all the sufferings, everything, it was worth it. It was worth it. And certainly if it keeps you from smacking your head on some of the things I smacked my head on, more than my entire life is surely worth it. To stop you from getting one scrape is worth my entire life. It really is. It's worth everything. Hmm. Folks, you're going into a new door, a new season. The truth will unfold right before us. The truth will. There are a lot of things in the Bible no one has really preached about nor talked about. They're going to start coming out. Can you tell? They're going to start coming forward. Can you tell? And it's not by man's doings. And I'm not just not talking about me. I'm talking about everybody. Everybody who has been given the assignment to feed the sheep. There are things in the Bible that have been here all this time, and they're going to come out of their mouths. I'm speaking of everybody who truly belongs to the Lord. True revelation will come out of their mouths because the outpouring of the Spirit has already begun. Just like the three wise men and the shepherds. I like that one. 
I never hear that taught anywhere, right? I know some of you guys missed it because you're joining a slate, but I didn't mean to say forget the wise men, but what I'm saying is that God revealed to the shepherds directly, told them everything. They beheld the glory of the Lord, heard the songs and the praises of heaven itself, while the three wise men had maps. They followed stars. God told the shepherds. That should tell you something. They just had to be shepherds, didn't they? They had to be the shepherds, and they had to be shepherding at night. That tells you something right there. In this world of darkness, there are shepherds here, and God will directly via the Holy Spirit show them all truth. See, I like that. That's the part. That is the part right there. That promise was not upon those wise men, but upon the shepherds. See that? When you need to know it, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal it to you. You will behold the glory and hear the praises after. And he'll do that directly. You don't need star charts. See, I love our Father because those shepherds, they didn't know about stars. To star charts and things of Babylon that deep, but guess what? The Lord told them directly. See, I love that part. I love that part. While everybody else talks about the three wise men, the shepherds are the ones that caught my attention. They received a direct truth at the right time, at the perfect time. They didn't receive that truth before they got to the manger. They didn't receive that truth after they left the manger. They received that truth while they were at the manger. You see that? Babylon, they had to study that for years and years and years and years to come up with the truth that the Lord departed unto his shepherds in a half a second, 30 seconds. I found that so amazing. You know what? That should let you know right there. Those who truly do belong to the Lord. They'll always be led in the right direction. But remember, the Holy Spirit reveals the true direction. So don't lead yourself. Be led of the Holy Spirit. We only go the wrong way when we lead ourselves. But if you're led of the Holy Spirit, you go the right way each and every time. That's almost as simple as that. Simple as that. I'm going to say God bless you guys. Get ready for Dr. V. He's coming up. And, oh, and by the way, Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. But most importantly, Father, thank you for your son, Jesus of Nazareth. I can't help but to thank him on this day. And yes, I'll probably get mushy here in a little bit, but uh, I just can't help but to thank him. There's no other way that I could have ever made it. No other way but through Christ. Believe me, if it were not for Christ... If it were not for his words and his walk, I would be hopeless. There's no hope for me in this world. That was only made possible through the Savior. Otherwise, I would be hopeless. And so I'm highly thankful. I'm perpetually thankful each and every day for my Lord and Savior. I've been that way for a long time, and I, I, I would imagine I'll continue to be that way. There's nothing on this earth that can remove my thanks. My thanks of what he did at the cross for us. There's no way I can pay him back. I don't follow Christ to be fed in this mortal body that I may obtain substance. I follow Christ because he is the Messiah. And if you follow him because he is the Messiah, then that's when he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And if you're part of his church, he's going to present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. So then he is claiming himself. Hmm. Dr. V, I will be, I'll be here. I'll be listening. Okay. Guys, I want to say God bless you. Thank you, Lord Jesus of Nazareth. 
Mm. If the world knew what I knew, you'd hear noise in the streets right now. You would. The whole world, you know what would happen if the world knew what I knew right now? All governments would lose power and convert today. They lose power. They would. Nobody would follow them anymore. They say, oh, no. No, Lord, the Lord is the Lord. I bet you if, if people knew what I knew, the Messiah would just have to come then because, shoot, he'd have to come because everybody would rejoice. If the whole world rejoiced over Jesus of Nazareth by way of the truth, he'd have to show up. God would inhabit those praises. God would be here, so then the Son would be here too. He just have to show up. Governments would lose power, and then they would convert. Wouldn't that be something? Those who are written in the book of life, get used to it, because that will happen when the entire earth sings his praises. They'll sing his praises because they realize the truth. They won't praise because they're forced to. They're going to praise out of the depths of them because they'll know the truth. See, to know the truth is to give him praise, and you have no problem with that. There'll be no complaints when the truth is known. Only praise and thanks. And that's what's in me right now. I have no complaints. Only praise. A sincere thanks. Because he is the Messiah. He is the word of God. He is faithful, and he is true. And nobody can take that away from me. Nobody. God bless each and every one of you. Dr. V, I'm queuing you up now. God bless you guys.